Ladies and gentlemen, honorable assistants, thank you for attending our ITU forum on ICT accessibility, a requisite towards an inclusive digital society. Uh, our presentation today, it will be done by several members that we do have in ITU and as Senior Program Officer in Digital Inclusion, I will begin my presentation to you, telling you, for those of you who are not very familiar with us, who is ITU. So, ITU is a leading UN agency for ICT with over 150 years of innovation and communication. We were born in 1865 in Paris as Telegraph Union, we have this name since 1934, uh, and in 47 we join the UN as the Special Agency in Information and Communication Technology. Our mandate is to connect the world without any discrimination. So to implement this mandate, we improve access to ICT to unserved communities worldwide, allocate global radio spectrum and satellite orbits, and develop the technical standards that ensure network and technology to seamlessly interconnect. So in short, every single time you make a phone call, you access the web, you order something, you travel by plane or ship and consult online navigation system, this is also due to ITU work. We are the only global network composed by leading representative in ICT sector with over 1,000 members from 193 countries. These are the government that we're working with and you will listen today a presentation from all of this member. We have over 700 sector members from private sector, industry and associate and we also have the pleasure to work with academic members. Only in area of ICT accessibility, all this person put joint efforts from building a policy and regulation to also try to work with industry and define new accessible ICT to ensure that this ICT access and services are accessible and affordable equitable to all, and the academic members to empower people through technology, education, and training. But we talk about information and communication technology. What is really information and technology, communication technology? So I think most of you are very used when we talk about ICT to think at computers, phones, what more? radio, TV, of course, but what about machine learning? What about artificial intelligence? What about Internet of Things and Web of Objectives? Are not these beyond the traditional concept of ICTs? I just put for you a snapshot of what does it mean in our day, the impact of information and communication technology in the society. And I pay your attention to two figures. The 7.5 billion mobile phone in use today, which is beyond the total number of the global population, and the estimated figure of 6.1 billion smartphone users that we'll have in less than two years. Okay. What does really ITU in this area? We have four main goals. And the goal number two is inclusiveness. And we have target for each of this. And the target number 2.5B is indicating that enabling environments ensuring accessible technology, so ICT, 
for persons with disabilities should be established in all countries by 2020. This is in less than two years. Okay, but why it's so important? Who really needs accessible ICT? Are we really talking exclusively about a need for 1.1 billion people who live with some type of disability as indicated by the report of the UN nation WHO, the World Health Organization? Well, for those of you who are not familiar, let me tell you that also from 2015, ITU worked very closely with WHO because over one billion youth are in risk of hearing loss due to unsafe listening devices. And only this year, in 2018, we do hope having by June a standard on this. But currently, all the use is affected. And let me tell you more than this. We estimate, based on the report of the UNDESA in aging population, which was last year, that we'll have a predicted number of aging population, and aging means above 60, of 2.1 billion people. And considering that by the same time, UNDESA also tell us that the world population will be around 9 million. Half of the world population would need accessible ICT in the 30 years because its world population is getting old and age-related disability is a reality for all of us and concern all of us. And I invite you to identify the country from where are you coming all over the world and see which it will be the situation in your country in few years. What ITUD does on digital inclusion? Before going to, to more statements, what really does digital, what really means digital inclusion? I want to pay your attention to the small um, difference, if you can see it, between the integration and inclusion. For those of you who remember, in, uh, in 2003, during the World Summit of Information Society, we were all talking about integration of all into the digital, into the information society. But is integration enough? So I think the concept evolved from integration to inclusion. So what really inclusion means, means that we really interact each other on the same condition. So the digital inclusion means the empowerment of people through information and communication technologies. And the target population that we are working on are persons with disabilities and elderly, indigenous people and people living in rural areas, women and girls, children and youth, and any other groups that request a specific need and attention for us to help them to communicate. What, in general, the United Nations do to achieve inclusive societies? So, most of you are already aware about the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the fact that ICTs are particularly indicated in the Article 9 and 30. And also, most of you know that globally, the Sustainable Development Goal, it's a joint effort of all of us to achieve inclusive societies. What I really want 
to share with you is the fact that ICT goes beyond this article because ICT virtually is part of every single moment of our life. And ICT also help person with disability to have an independent life. So that is another article. And the ICT actually are going through all the articles of this CRPD because in any area of our life, ICT can help us. So access of person with disability to information and communication technology in equal condition and elimination of barrier for enabling their independent life. Okay, but what is equal access to ICT? I love this picture, it's a cartoon. And if you really want to retain only one slide for my whole presentation, please retain this one. So let's imagine that these boxes are ICTs, phones. Let's make it simple. We provide phones, the same phone to everybody. These three persons want to have access to an information. They want to see the baseball match. And we provide equal access. Is this enough? What about this one? What if we provide a product that has embedded all the possibilities and everybody is using it based on his own needs. So the taller guy will not use it because it's tall enough. Let's say that a smartphone for young people will not use any accessibility feature because they don't use it. The second guy can use some of this feature, like me, I use some of this feature to increase the fonts, increase the contrast. And the small one can be a person with more severe visual impairment and can use all the feature that he needs. In this way, going from equality to equity, actually we manage to provide access to information to all. And what is all, this is what is actually accessible ICT. So when we go from equity, from equality to equity to facilitate access to information to all user, we can say that we achieve accessible ICTs. What do we mean by accessible, assistive, and affordable? This three A. So accessible ICT, as shared with you previously, it's an equipment or a service that has embedded accessibility feature from design or fabrication stage. So this can be used by all its intended users, regardless their capabilities. And more than this, these are compatible with assistive technology. And what about assistive technologies? Assistive technologies, it's a separate hardware or software added to our equipment of service to enable the person with disabilities to overcome a specific barrier they face to access information and communication. So actually, they are used to enable or to compensate user functional motor, sensory, or intellectual limitation. So they are a complement of accessible ICTs. And affordability is also very important because the lack of affordability is also a barrier. And this is a barrier for persons with disabilities, but this is a barrier for all of us. So, ICT must be accessible and affordable for all.
I give you here some example of accessible ICT, and I just want to pay to your attention a link that I'm already seeing to the universal design. So you all recognize some of this accessible ICT, but I want to pay your attention to, this is a screenshot for my own mobile, in which, as I've told you, I have some uh, accessibility feature there in French because I'm living in Switzerland. But the most important, I also uh, have here for you a screenshot for perhaps some of you knows about the WhatsApp uh, facility to send vocal messages. So uh, here is my uh, communication with my mother, who is 75, and my daughter. My daughter speaks Romanian, but has, don't know how to write in Romanian. So my mother has some visual impairments due to her age, so she cannot send messages. So actually, this facilitates my mother to speak in Romania and to send a message, and my daughter to send back a message to her grandma, just using this feature, which is not an accessibility feature, but it was meant to be a tool for communication to all. Of course, example of equipment, a software of assistive technology that you know, and we do consider that if we manage to have more accessible ICT and affordable ICT, the prices will going down, so even the assistive technology will be affordable. And only one example, the um, screen readers. Over 10 years ago, a screen readers cost was over bigger than the cost of the computer. In our days, the screen readers, nobody can actually evaluate the value of a screen reader because they are embedded in the computer. But how we can make this ICT to be accessible? In two words. Either through law and regulation and standards, and I have the pleasure to let you know that you all know what this is, and I remember, for those of you who are my age, then our first mobile had a bump on the uh, number five. This was actually um, to assist blind and visually impaired people and others during the night, for instance, to facilitate dialing under low light condition. And also we have like web accessible directive, which is also an accessible accessibility of the website, a mobile application of public sector bodies, at the one adopted by uh, European Commission here. We also can achieve this uh, ICT to be accessible to public procurement, which is all between. The public procurement account for a large po uh, portion of the spend on ICT in most countries. The governments are the bigger buyer in the world, and everybody wants government to buy from them. So a number of countries have an accessible ICT procurement system or uh, simply they realize that it would be profitable for them to have such requirements in their procurement. But what about the market law? This is the most important. You have here some benefits and motivation for industry and a very nice quote from Adobe. They will never have two line of fabrication. If they have, if they are requested to make an accessible ICT to may sell their products to the government, they will make only accessible ICT. In addition, people with disability are customers. And the most important, this is a global market which is growing every single day. Only last year, we were talking about 1.3 trillions. And this was only for 1 billion people. Please think at what I was telling you, that in the next 20 to 30 years, this it will be half of the world population. In short, it's a win for all. For persons with disabilities, because help them to have an independent life, 
for all of us to have social inclusion and economic development, for governments to ensure that all citizens without discrimination have access to the information, communication, public services, market, to pay back taxes, because if not, they have to pay for this person with disabilities. And in addition, when government and public authorities purchase accessible ICT, they create accessible employment environment, deliver better value for money, and make this accessible ICT affordable. Not need to reiterate the benefit for industry and manufacturers, improve business benefit, and create a market that it's for them really good to follow. Resources that ITR is actually having at your disposal. Of course, policy report that is done with our members G3 ICT. It's online, six languages. Just go and take all the information there. We have online courses on tutor-led on public procurement and only this year we'll develop from now until end of uh, June three self-based training courses in ICT accessibility as well as some video tutorials. The last tool that I really want to spend one more minute uh, in it is the key resource that we develop in national program of web accessibility which is called Internet for All. We can in only one week provide to a country all the tools they need to put in place a web accessibility throughout the country, policy in place throughout the country. So we develop the political buy-in throughout the government, we give them the necessary tools for developing the website accessible but also the content and we also provide them a self-sustainable model to raise funding for digital training in pers for persons with disabilities. Because regardless of the fact that we build accessible website, we put inside accessible content, if the person with disabilities do not know how to access this and how to use this accessible website, we didn't reach our goal. So, this is already available in several languages and any country who is interested in this will be there to serve. In conclusion, I think it's obvious ICT accessibility is not a good for persons with disability exclusively. It's a good for all of us, for aging population, for immigrants and refugees, for illiterate people, for industry manufacturers, for private sector, governments to increase country social and economic development for all of us. So ICT accessibility enables communication for all and in ensure digital inclusive societies. Of course, that everybody's work can make a difference. But on my view, only working together, we can make the change. Thank you for your attention. I will now introduce a representative of the government, which is also an IT member, Mrs. Amela Odobasis for, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, to give her own views on how she managed to achieve ICT accessibility in her country. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. And uh, I really, in the beginning, I have to say that I'm very honored to be here today. This is the first Zero Project Conference that I'm participating and I must say that I'm absolutely stunned, uh, not only by the organization, but by the choices of topics. And uh, I will definitely be back. Um, as um, Roxana said, I, I have to give you a bit of background of, about myself, you see, because some of you may ask yourself, oh, so what, what is it that special about Bosnia and Herzegovina, such a small country, um, you know, that, uh, that has achieved in the area of ICT accessibility? Namely, yes, I do represent um, a state institution. I come from Communications Regulatory Agency. We are a national regulatory authority. We are a state independent, but still belong to the state structures. 
Um, for all of you who do not know, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a very small country with a population of 3.7 uh, million people. And I am emphasizing that only because later on I will be talking about the regional initiative and regional outreach, which is so very important. So what I am uh, going to talk to you, uh, to, to, to present today, is basically my experience um, on what the governments in the developing countries, I emphasize, should be doing in ensuring ICT accessibility. So um, basically I will go through, um, through a major distinction on how to make a distinction between um, proactive and uh, reactive uh, policy makers as well as other stakeholders. I would like to, uh, based on my personal experience, like to outline what are the tools of mobilization, how to mobilize them, how to really move them into um, you know, doing something and taking some activities in this particular area, as well as uh, regional outreach. So, um, as well as in most of uh, developing countries, um, when we talk about legal framework, okay, uh, legal framework is in place, right? What the what the governments usually do? Oh well, you know they ratify the convention and they just incorporate it in the legal framework, and that's it. Our job is done. Uh, they are um, not even at that point aware that their job uh, hasn't even started in ensuring that. Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, is committed that uh, in our um, uh, you know, process, as you know, we are not a member of the European Union, okay, we wish, but we have a very long way to go. But um, this process of pre-accession process uh, is really a good exercise for us to harmonize our legislation with the uh, uh, be it, uh, European Disability Strategy, European Accessibility Act, as well as, and, and um, incorporate uh, all other international standards and uh, practices in our legislation uh, work. Um, I've joined the ITUD um, question on ICT accessibility for persons with disabilities, Roxana, it was the beginning of 2015, and uh, I really have to say that my knowledge on the importance of ensuring accessible ICTs um, from the point of view of regulatory authority was limited, okay? And mind you, I mean, we are being considered in one of the uh, um, more advanced regulatory authority in our region, which is the region of the Western uh, Balkans. So when we compare you know, ourselves to Serbia, to Macedonia, Albania, etc., Bosnia and Herzegovina was really, I mean, we have a converged regulatory authority and we thought that we were really doing so well. Um, so um, before I joined uh, the, um, the, 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 the question, uh, ITUD question on uh, question seven, um, and I really have to say that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there was a limited knowledge of the topic, of the existing interna international standards and practices. Um, once I started uh, talking to not, well, not only with the institutions outside of our own organization, I actually realized that within the, the, the regulatory authority, we had a limited knowledge. We, uh, we did not have the regulatory framework that would meet uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the requirements, the country's requirements in this particular area. And uh, what really stunned me that there was a little or none cooperation with civil society between the institutions, between the government institutions and um, with civil society, including persons with uh, disabilities. Um, I really, uh, I'm not talking here only on behalf of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the region I come from, considering that uh, during my work uh, in the previous mandate uh, with the ITUD question seven, I was also uh, one of the leading authors of the um, global report on the um, accessible ICTs for the question seven, and I really, I mean, I think I, hundreds of contributions that were submitted globally uh, went through my hands and, uh, and they were included in this wonderful section of that report, uh, which is uh, the particular section of, um, on global uh, good practices. 
So, uh, so I, I surely really say that uh, what, uh, what we are experiencing in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the region, uh, most of developing countries is uh, experiencing so. Uh, of course, you know, not only to justify my uh, absence when I, when I would go to, to Geneva, so I really thought, let me just see what I can do when I get back. And I uh, started um, implementing uh, be it the standards, be it the practices, you know, try to sort of like make certain changes within our organization and uh, throughout the institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, as a result, what we did, I mean, first of all, uh, I'm really pleased to say that within um, less than a couple of years, the, re the existing legislation on ICTs um, policies uh, as well as the regulation was revised and updated and uh, thanks to uh, thanks to the advocacy efforts and the uh, uh, network of people that we included uh, we have to say that the governments did not object you know uh, incorporating such changes we even went um, a, a step further and uh, we, uh, in exchange, um, in, in exchange of our experiences with the surrounding countries, uh, for example, we were just um, replicating the good practices when it comes to uh, updating the legislation. So uh, the second very important step that was uh, undertaken was um, consultation with persons with disabilities, with associations, and um, trying to really. Uh, position us as the institutions as well as other institutions as their partners, as their allies, and that was much appreciated. And uh, last but not least important, I mean, we, we devised and implemented um, a far-reaching advocacy campaign. I can talk about advocacy campaign. I mean, it's a t definitely uh, a subject that I feel so passionate about because in my full-time job, I'm heading public affairs departments of communication, and advocacy is really uh, my, my primary uh, my primary job. Uh, so let me just point out some of the tools that we've implemented, as I also uh, briefly mentioned here, that are very important for mobilisation of key stakeholders. Uh, and first one is definitely obtaining capacity building from by, provided by the ITUD. I quite uh, like to say very often, you know, especially to, to Roxana, I mean, who is so passionate and who is so devoted to all the members, I mean, when it comes to sharing her knowledge and expertise, that uh, they, they literally created me. And, uh, and then um, through the trainings uh, that I deliver now throughout the region on uh, ICT accessibility, I managed to create the network of the like-minded people and to, to, continue, um, into, um, to continue with the capacity uh, building. The next tool that is inevitable, that is creating a national model based on ITUD standards and best practices. Why I emphasize this one? We cannot simply, in developing countries, very often the mistakes are being made um, uh, in the cases when you have those um, uh, practices and, and experiences being just imported. Okay, they must be adjusted to a very specific circumstances, uh, to a very specific environment of that particular country. I've already mentioned implementing advocacy campaigns and raising awareness as, um, as a tool for mobilization of all key stakeholders providing training, is changing knowledge policies and practices and ensuring timely implementation. This is just one photo of a training that we delivered in Montenegro together uh, with the IT, um, ITUD with me as a trainer, and this was really impressive. 35 people participated from the state institution, civil society, and representatives also from the persons with disabilities. And here, I'm just going to, before I wrap up, I know that I already warned me that uh, my 10 minutes is running out. I really must say that uh, regional outreach is crucial in whichever part of the world uh, your, uh, your, your, your country is. Uh, and uh, we were very lucky in our region because uh, we do not have language barriers, we understand each other perfectly well. Uh, so we strengthened that regional cooperation also through regional initiative, uh, Euro uh, through European and regional initiative uh, within the ITU. And uh, we are planning a number of activities together. Um, so, uh, also, it is regional outreach is very important to promote guidelines, to exchange knowledge and share good practices, or as we would say, you know, it's, we do not have to, in most of the cases, reinvent the wheel. Okay, the wheel is already there, so we just have to see how we are going to, uh, to roll it. Uh, this is also illustration of a training that we did in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
And now I'm going to conclude with what is the way, to, way, uh, way forward. The way forward is definitely the implementation. And I, when I talk about implementation, I'm very often talk about the so-called implementation cycle. And the, uh, the, the, the key um, player in that, uh, the key activity is reaching out to the governments to build political will. After that, uh, or simultaneously, uh, it is important to create a roadmap of requirements to ensure implementation of accessible ICTs, um, to put an emphasis on regional uh, cooperation, and most importantly, we have to go a step further, and that is to ensure the monitoring, you see, because unless we monitor, unless we evaluate, we do not know to what level we'll fulfill the task when it comes to implementation. And I'm going to say thank you at this point, and I would be very happy to answer any of your questions if they're related. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mela. Let's listen a little bit the private sector. And I have the pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Monica Lohan, who is also leading the hair colors in Mexico. And please, Monica. Thank you, Roxana. Uh, thank you very much. I know everyone is tired. But this is good news. There's a market opportunity. There's money <laughs> by being inclusive. So that's a good news. So yes, um, as, as, as Rosanna was saying, and, and all the efforts that by our governments are doing in, in making reality accessible, digital accessibility, I'm going to, to talk about our experience in the private market and in the private market of a Latin American country such as Mexico, where even though we do have regulations on accessibility, the implementation is still way, way far of what we would like to see. So I did a, a simple search on what web accessibility, this is a sales search on the Google uh, search engine, to, and I, I look for three different words. I look for usability, which is the red. I, I look for web content accessibility guidelines, which is the yellow and is the standard. And I look for web accessibility, which is the blue line that we can see at the bottom of the graph. So what, what amazes me in, in, this, in, this, in this search is that no one is searching for web accessibility. Everyone is searching on usability and no one is searching on web accessibility. So what the, the market opportunity really is, is in using all the good on you, all the goods that you can have by being accessible on usabilities and try to market the, the, good, the inclusion through usability, which is what really the, are looking for in the market. So I, I just pointed out South Korea because it's the only country in the world that web accessibility was more popular in the search engine than accessibility. So also there's a clear market opportunity in South Korea <laughs> if every, anyone wants to go over there. So the market opportunity in, in Latin America only 2.8 billion ICT is investment in ICTs in, in 19, it's expected to be expected in, in next year. So we have a growth market rate of 4.3%. 4 Companies are spending in UX. Companies are, as we saw in, in the graph before, companies are investing in usability. And there's a lot of, of market opportunity in usability. But what, what the, those companies do not know is that when we're doing accessibility, a big part of the usability is already solved. So this is an invitation of all the professionals that are working and are, are driving the, the inclusion and the web accessibility strategies to start thinking of selling accessibility through its usability benefits because that's where, where people are spending spending money on. And two drivers, two drivers for the market. One is creation of capabilities because no one knows what web accessibility is, no one knows how to implement web accessibility, and the other one is awareness. And one of the, the great thing about the conference that we could we saw on all these applications that are being developed on Gary, on all all those resources that are there and that are free, that we only need to Oh, to create awareness on the existence of all that. It's amazing that in, in countries such as Mexico, no one knows that there are accessibility functionalities in our phones. So why 
to think that a blind person could be a potential customer if he's not on the net because they don't know that once you have a phone you have the power you have the tool to be able to serve the net and being able to buy and being able to do tons of things online so this is part of the awareness they need to know, the market need to know, the private sector need to know, the companies that are spending need to know that there's a market opportunity, that there are functionalities, that functionalities are free, and that there are tons of potential customers ready to, and with the tools to buy, to, to go to your website to learn, etc. And creation of capabilities. One is, of course, government. Government is the through procurement, through regulator, are the enabler of a market, of an accessibility market per se. Once the first government will send a bid requiring accessibility in their website, accessibility will be there. And you pass the cost of accessibility to the developers, to the companies that want to sell to the market. So you, it's a driver and, and a way to create a market of accessibility. Of course, the national program created by ITU is a great tool to create a market because not only you get the political buy-in, which is very important for this market creation, but also you create capabilities among the countries. You create these trained the trainers capability so you can spread the word on web accessibility. And a part of, 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 of the training of ITU, which is interesting, is it's they're just giving you what is there. They're not inventing anything, they're giving you where are the standards, what are the functionalities that already exist, what you can use really at the very low cost and already exist and work in order to advance in, in digital accessibility, in web accessibility. And at the end we have the G3 ICT, the EAAP, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, which is a very good effort to really create professionals on web accessibility. So even though in countries that are like ours, we start, we're in the awareness process, just you need to know what web accessibility is, you need to know that usability and web accessibility comes hand in hand, but also once we've created some professionals, when the government start buying accessible ICTs, accessible website, we will need to professional this capacity and this is also a very interesting way to create uh, professionals on web accessibility. So three, three main creation of capabilities, training of developers uh, in designing accessible websites, how do we make these accessible websites, and of course, my recommendation is always use the, the standard, the web content accessibility guidelines. I know in, in, in Brazil, for instance, they created our ad hoc standard, but well, my recommendation is always better do and use what everyone is doing, what everyone, and countries like ours that we import technology, the chances that all these technology are complying with the best practice around the world are very high. So my recommendation is go with the flow, Training on accessible content because it is also a reality that we, when we go to a website it's not because we want to pay taxes, so we don't actually need that the government do this kind of website accessible, but we want information. We want to buy, we want to, to, to consume information. So all this information that we're uploading online, what we're putting on our social networks, need to be accessible. In Mexico, we have elections in July, so we're really working with the candidates to see if we want to have um, 11 million votes that are the number of persons with disability in Mexico, they need to hear your message. And to hear your message, you have to upload all your information on an accessible format online. So do we need these kind of trainings. And then again, it's not a very difficult because we are importing technology. So once we are using YouTube, all those platforms already have functionalities of accessibility. The only thing they need to know is how to use those functionalities and the awareness of it all. And finally, procurement. The governments are the biggest clients that any country could have. So through procurement, also training governments, but we will see that uh, in the later, but training governments to buy accessible ICTs is a driver to create a market. Awareness, of course, awareness of in, in the universities, in the companies. It's amazing that when we go to a company to talk about a web accessibility or digital accessible content, they're amazed. It's like <laughs> telling them, giving them candy. Because they've ne some, so many companies have never heard about digital accessibility. So when we teach them how to put subtitles on YouTube, they really feel, they have this feeling of conquering the world, of being a better person. So 
awareness is very important and it's very easy. So talk to the government, digital marketing companies, in relation to CEO, in relation to, and companies about their corporate in, uh, responsibility of being accessible. And also, there's a benefits, the economic and social benefits of accessibility. The economic benefits is you have an increase of, in sales. 11 million Mexicans have a disability and are surfing the net because they have the, the, our mobile and internet penetration in Mexico is above 100%. So we do have 11 million people waiting to buy, to consume your information that are not attended. So there is client acquisition. There is also the search engine positioning. All the marketing digital companies are hungry for SEO. So there's SEO, there's positioning, there's visibility, there's profitability, and also it's a, co it's a competitor differentiator. I'm a good person versus my competition who's not that accessible. So yes, there's a, a driving for market opportunity and the famous low competition, low, the long tail. No, the, there, the green section are the 11 million Mexicans that no one is targeting. So it's a very in, interesting market opportunity. On the social benefit side, of course, government for all. The government in Mexico, like in Latin America, and most of the countries that have ratified the convention, we do have laws that include or, or in the, the right of inclusion in the digital aspects, web or digital content. So it's government for all. It's access, it's email, it's all these social benefits that we can get and we can boost through the digital accessibility. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Monica, for this fantastic presentation on everything you are achieving in Mexico. And now, Donald. Um, Donald, uh, it's also an ITU expert. We are doing a lot of capacity building in procurement with you. But this time, I would like you to speak from your country perspective if possible. So, what would you like to share with the audience today, Don? Thanks, Roxana, um, and thank you very much for, 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 for bringing this forum together, and thank you to Zero for, um, for, for having this. Um, so, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a very elaborate system of checks and balances going on here around timekeeping, and <laughs> all three speakers have been almost to the minute on time so far. So I, I hope uh, not to let the side down and to keep this um, brief uh, to the point um, and, and to, to, to time. Um, what I'd like to finish on, and I think it's in keeping with the spirit of this conference, which is about good practices, is just to have an overview of some global resources that are available to us all around capacity building, and training and education online around uh, ICT uh, accessibility. So it's really just a, a snapshot of some of the leading practices and examples. It's not a comprehensive overview, um, and there is uh, no endorsement implied in anything that I, I, I um, present on, um, but it does provide some good practice and interesting examples. Um, so I'll cover capacity building. Um, resources available to help build national and international communities of ICT accessibility professionals, creating communities of practices and developing professional recognition um, and development systems, and then some resources for online training and education, looking at the new MOOCs, the massive open online courses that are available on ICT accessibilities, um, the collective creation of high quality professional um, online courses um, uh, uh, that are available. So first on uh, accessibility um, or capacity building, um, as already mentioned, one of the main um, sources of uh, or, or one of the main um, professional associations that's um, uh, available globally at the moment is the um, International Association of Accessi Accessibility Professionals. They're a division of G3ICT. Um, they look at professional and organizational development, certification, things like networking within the community of ICT professionals, um, and they endeavor to influence and in, uh, change within the ICT um, industry. And when I started off, I suppose, 
15 years ago working on, on ICT accessibility, you know, the, one of the main communities available was to come to conferences like this. Um, and I think this is trying to make that network of, of uh, ICT professionals um, uh, more global. It's also trying to attract people in to ICT um, uh, uh, accessibility. Um, one of the experiences in my own country um, is our national um, computer society, the Irish Computer Society, says that unlike architects or engineers, IT professionals don't tend to get interested in professionalization, certification, or rec recognition for their qualifications until their mid 30s. Um, so it is something that the ICT industry is a little bit behind in um, uh, at the curve on in terms of acknowledging professional qualifications and capabilities of IT professionals. So the member profile at the end of 2017, there's 1,364 members across 76 organizations and 39 countries. So there's quite a, a, a large community um, have joined the IAAP. Um, and it's not just for people who have ICT accessibility capacity and want acknowledgement for that, it's also for people who want to build their capacity. So the IAAP certification process um, involves exams, it involves different levels of certification. There's a, a, a core fundamental level of certification, there's a web accessibility uh, specialist certification and then there's the pro certified professional in web accessibility which combines the top two which is the, pro the foundational and the web accessibility specialist certification so when you get those two um, uh, you can get the third um, and a new development in, in that uh, association of, pro of accessibility professionals is they're looking to have a procurement specialist certification coming on stream um, this year um, in 2018. Um, it's always good when you visit a country to give some acknowledgement to what's happening in that country and in Austria there is a national certification um, system um, and possibly this is one that might be of interest to people like myself who are looking as we are in my organization the Center for Excellence in Universal Design at some sort of certification mechanism for ICT professionals and we've been looking at this quite a long time and have, are, are conducting research with Funka from Sweden at the moment as to what that could look like. Um, but the model that we're aware of in Austria, and thank you to um, Klaus Hockner for, for the information on this and I hope Klaus I get, I get, I get it right, um, uh, is a, a certification system offered by the Austrian um, Federal Economic Chamber and the Austrian Computer Society. Um, it offers an ISO accredited certification for web accessibility uh, experts. And companies in Austria, uh, I believe, receive some support for accessibility consultancy. So that's a, a driver for uh, uh, ICT professionals to get certification um, for, for web accessibility. And I believe there's approximately 60 people so far have been through this system and have gotten certification. And there's more uh, information available on this on the insights.at website, which is the, tra the, the training um, partner of the Austrian Computer Society. How did I do, Klaus? Yes, but only in German. Unfortunately, the <laughs> German language. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but if, if you want, we can translate it. <laughs> okay, well, I, I did look up, I got some of this information through Google Translate, and it did a, a, a good job. Some resources, so thank you, Klaus, for that information. Some resources that are available and have been mentioned already from um, the ITU are the uh, Making Television Accessible report, the Model ICT policy report, um, and uh, the mobile and telecommunications accessibility um, report. And those are very good baseline documents to look at technical um, issues related to uh, ICT accessibility in different areas, but also policy and regulations um, and models of those um, for policymakers uh, in country. 
some other resources that are available to you, and, and, and these are, some of these are, are G3ICT resources. Um, G3ICT, in partnership with UNESCO, has a model policy for inclusive ICT in education. Uh, essentially what these model policies are, are almost off-the-shelf policies that a country could take in the absence of having any policy in place. Um, I, I think in fairness, in reality, there's no country that's going to take a model policy and just put it in, implement it, but I think the model policies provide very good baseline um, uh, for what policies should include for inclusive ICT um, in education. Smart cities, there's a toolkit available, um, again, and there's URLs in my presentation that per, will, you can follow to go to all of these resources. Um, and recently, G3ICT put together a procurement portal and charter, so previously I was involved in a, a, a toolkit for public procurement in Europe. Um, there are similar resources in the US, um, but this portal is an amalgamation of all those resources and a good point to go to to find out more about public procurement and ICT accessibility. So on to the second part, which is online education and training. Um, I, I, I must start off by talking about the work that the ITU have done in this area. Um, and there is a public procurement um, of accessible ICT products and services six weeks online training course, tutor led by myself. We've run it two to three years, I think, in a row at this stage. Um, and it provides a quite in-depth training on public procurement for ICTs. Um, what we're also looking, though, is, uh, is to develop some other courses on, on ICT accessibility. Um, as uh, Roxana mentioned earlier, three self-paced courses. So these are much shorter two-hour courses that give an introduction to ICT accessibility, an introduction to standards and policy, an introduction to public procurement. And then if you want to go on and learn more, there's the tutor-led course uh, available. Just looking at this, I was thinking when I was doing this presentation, have I been, because I'm uh, developing this for ITU, have I been designing myself out of a job? If this course is really successful, then they might need the tutor led anymore. But I think, and we'll see in a moment, I'll talk about MOOCs, these more extensive courses. I think there's a need for many different types of educational offerings, I suppose, online, whether they're short two-hour courses, more in-depth six-week courses, or, or the bigger MOOCs. Um, so more information will become available on this when, when these um, three self-paced learning courses are, are developed. I want to finish by looking at two MOOCs that have been developed, and these are very exciting um, developments in the area. Uh, again, thank you to Christopher Lee, who I know is at the conference for information um, on this. There was a MOOC developed by uh, the Accessibility Solutions and Research Centre with G3ICT uh, and Georgia Tech. Um, the course is an online course that looks at issues and design solutions for ICT accessibility for customers and employees with disabilities. Uh, and participants learn the foundations of ICT accessibility through to the principles of accessible ICT design, identify issues around assistive technology. Um, so again, it's very much a, a, a foundation course, um, but it, there's a lot of information available on it. It's available um, on the uh, um, edX uh, uh, platform, edx.org, um, and just some uh, data on, on it. It's been um, enrolled across 161 countries, so participants from 161 countries have enrolled in it. 25% of those are from the USA, but interestingly, 10% of enrollment has come from India uh, and 4% from Nigeria. So we're seeing a global spread when these courses are, are made available uh, right across the, the globe um, on this. Um, how am I doing in time? Okay. The second MOOC I'd like to talk to you about was one that was developed in Europe. Um, it was off the, the back of a European, uh, European project called the MOOCAP. 
Um, you don't get funding in Europe unless you can come up with a really corny acronym, I find. So this MOOCAP project uh, resulted in a, a, a MOOC on digital accessibility, enabling participation in the information society. And that was done, uh, developed by a wide range of partners in, in, in Europe, um, the University of Southampton, the Dublin Institute of, of Technology, HIOA in Oslo, um, and, and a few others. Um, again, this is a, a, an online course. It's approximately six weeks in length. Uh, it looks at the barriers encountered, encountered by uh, people with various forms of, of disabilities or difficulties using ICT. Um, it looks again similarly at digital accessibility, people with disabilities and technology, standards, assistive technology and, and, and guidelines. Uh, that's available on the futurelearn.com uh, um, platform. Uh, and I have some interesting statistics on that. that there has been nearly 10,000 participants have enrolled in this. About 7,500 people came to it online and about 2,500 people who enrolled in it were already engaged in learning in these educational institutions. Um, the participation rate or the, the graduation rate has been 10%. Now that might sound quite low, but actually in terms of MOOCs, it's, it's quite a good statistic. So typically the, the, um, the, the level of completion of MOOCs is, is, is quite low in the si single figures percentages. So the uh, number of people graduating from that has been, has been quite high. Um, and it has been uh, taken up by people across 151 countries. So I think if we have something to learn from what's happening in the area around MOOCs and online courses is that they are being taken up um, and there is room for more, um, perhaps more focused ones and ones of different duration. Finally, just to plug some work that we're doing in Ireland, um, we invite you all to, in October, um, late October, early November, to our Universal Design um, Higher Education Technology Conference. Um, it'll, it's a four-day congress at Dublin Castle with partners from across Europe um, and, and Canada. Um, and then I just want to quickly acknowledge uh, people who contributed to this presentation. Um, so you all know who you are. Thank you very much for the information and the, the data you provided uh, to me. Um, and I'll finish with that and I'll be delighted to take any questions and answer them to the best of my ability um, after this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donald, for your presentation. I think it's very important to have different views from government to private sector and the tools available to make this happen. And with all this in place, I have the pleasure to invite our colleague from the EU. I think it's not any more presentation to be done because everybody knows you, Ima. In fact, if we can uh, go, we wanted to have an interactive discussion with you because we have the pleasure to announce you that uh, ITU uh, is trying to join efforts with our colleagues in EU and have for the very first time an uh, event which is Accessible Europe. Uh, for some of you who, who know or who are more familiar with ITU activities, we are on our fifth edition in Accessible Americas, which is one of the most successful regional events in ICT accessibility and help this region to be, for us, a world champion up to now in implementing ICT accessibility. And thanks to all the efforts done here in Europe to advance in this area, we do hope that from um, this year we'll have more concrete um, activities that will help the countries in Europe to have accessible ICTs and to have the final goal, which is inclusive digital societies. So with your permission, I would like to give you the floor because we would like to identify the subjects that you consider would be important for you to be developed, discussed, debated during this regional event, and which would be let's say, the proposal that you would like to make in order to accelerate this process. 
So the floor is yours. We also put at your disposal for some of you who don't have uh, the time to, to stay with us uh, until the end. We, you, you will find in your desk some, uh, some flyers on this. But um, meanwhile, uh, we will very much appreciate listening from you. What do you think that are the most important things to consider in this first accessible Europe? So who would like to, to begin? Please. Hi, Roxana. Well, thank you to all for the really interesting uh, presentations. And um, my question would be, because Monica mentioned, we do have fantastic tools, actually, and it's about awareness raising. And as she said, it can be very easy because it doesn't cost you anything. We just need people to get them the knowledge. But at the same time, it has proven to be very difficult to reach the right people. So maybe one session could really be that we put some of the organizations together and ask them, well, we have all those tools. What is stopping you from using them? How can we make the tools more accessible? What is maybe the little things that help you put them into practice? So to get different stakeholders tell us, OK, here are the tools, here are you. Why, why are you not using them? What can we do to help you? OK. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like if possible, to present yourself very briefly and uh, from, uh, from where you are. So, uh... <laughs> okay, my apologies. So I add that. I'm Sabine Lobnik. I'm actually based in Austria and I work with Michael together for the Mobile and Wireless Forum and uh, we have the Gary project. So one of the tools that we would really like to share with everyone and to be used in practice as much as possible. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Klaus from Austria. As mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm working with the Austrian Disability Forum and I'm working also with the Austrian Computer Society uh, and we developed some schedules and schemes for uh, certification of websites and uh, person of, uh, working in the field, programming in the field. Yeah. But uh, in connection to that, what's, what Sabine said, uh, I think one of the most important problems that we have that, uh, is, is that the deciders, they don't know why they should do accessible features on their websites and they don't know uh, uh, what, are the <clears throat> what are the goals, because why, 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 we should, why we should make alt texts, why we should make uh, description of links and, and, and all this stuff, they don't know it. Uh, and the best thing would be to uh, first to identify the deciders and then to bring them together with persons with disabilities that they sh show them why it's necessary to have an accessible website, for example. Thank you very much, Carl. So in short, actually, your proposal is um, raise awareness, explain uh, with the end user, uh, concrete demo, where are the barriers in order to, to make this subject more understandable for all, and so understanding why we need these accessible websites. Is that correct? That's yes, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you so much for your intervention. The gentleman, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Bhaskar Bhattacharji. I am from Access to Information Program, A2I, Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh. Uh, my, I have two concerns. One, uh, uh, ITU, do you have any plan to organize such accessible uh, um, accessibility conference in regionally, like in Asia, especially in South Asia, because we, we are now developing a new nations, like digital, dig, digital nations. I think um, Bangladesh also leading in this way and other country also doing wonderful work on digitalization. But this digitalization creating digital barrier for people with disabilities. We have now hundred thousands of content which are not accessible. And we are struggling with a 25,000 website we just, our government have developed. Now we need to ensure that all websites should be accessible for people with disabilities. And also, um, how, uh, another important issues, you know, still there is a hundred to, hundreds of 
language which don't have any high quality text to speech. That's why visually impaired people are not able to access information equal basis with others. So without us, nothing about us. Absolutely. And I think this is the biggest challenge for the SDZ that people with disabilities are still struggling to get the accessible information and technology. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your intervention. So um, I can uh, already respond to you with regards the the tools of the first part of your question. Uh, in case if Bangladesh uh, would be uh, interested to have this national program on web accessibility internet for all delivered in country, uh, the only thing that you have to, to do is to ask IT, ITUD to implement this in, in your country. Uh, the, um, as mentioned, this is already available in English, French, Arabic, and Spanish. If one of this uh, language can be already of uh, interest to you, we are ready to do it as soon as you want to, uh, us to do it. With regard to the regional uh, accessibility uh, forums, uh, in general, we expect from the region, from the member to manifest this interest. ITU will not impose those. So that's why in this case, in Europe, considering all the effort that the country have been done in this area and manifested their interest, and um, as you probably know, because you are our member, it was even uh, at the last WTDC, the World Telecommunication Development Conference has last year, the members globally agree that web accessibility is one of the priority and this it will be uh, work throughout our study groups meeting in which I have the pleasure to invite you uh, from, uh, from this April. But in addition to this, the Europe and the Americas, they um, have regional initiative in web accessibility. So all the power in, is in your hands to manifest the wish to, to have this in your region. Meanwhile, we take note that this is of your interest and we'll share with our colleagues in the region. Thank you so much. Someone else? Ima? Um, thanks, Rosanna. I mean, I, I think it has been really um, a very um, interesting panel with, with a lot of uh, information to, to, to share. Um, when Rosanna approached me to, to say that I wanted to, to organize this event, I said that we will have a look at it. I have to go back home and, uh, and consult, uh, of course, all my uh, hierarchy, but um, what um, I see that uh, that uh, ETU is proposing to do, um, which is uh, take advantage of the tools um, and resources that the EU has produced in terms of legislation, in terms of standards, in terms of policies, and um, uh, extend their use uh, further than the borders of the Union. Um, well, I see that, uh, first of all, of course, they can do it, <laughs> the question, uh, and uh, I think it is, it is really a great, a great idea. We're going to see how. I mean, I was really particularly happy to see that uh, um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they are already looking to, to um, a directive that we are preparing and finalizing and already getting ready. I mean, wow, uh, you know, this is really something uh, important. And as many of you might be doing legislation, I would say, yes, get an inspiration. And uh, we also got an inspiration when preparing this directive from the from the US, from the work that the US had been doing. So um, if we can uh, share our resources, of course, uh, of course, we will do it. When looking to the different areas that have been mentioned, I think they are uh, they are um, very important, and I would like to to highlight two two things. First of all, is that we need to have um, definitions of accessibility and definitions of accessibility in terms of requirements, and those should be across all sectors and applications. When you talk about the web, the web should be accessible whether it is for a bank or whether it is for transport services. We need those requirements, but we also need those requirements in other ICT when we are talking about uh, 
for example, um, self-service terminals. You know, why should a self-service terminal accessibility, the features, the accessibility features of a self-service terminal used in transport be completely different to the one that is going to be used in a bank or for other applications? So we need to have those kind of, of, of technical requirements um, that should be harmonize as much as possible across across um, sectors and those should be a kind of resources and for that we also we have not mentioned uh, uh, before but we are developing technical standards at european level that um, uh, in fact um, more than uh, not only european uh, union countries are members of the standardization organizations already those standards belong to countries um, um, for, uh, of more, of more, um, of more uh, than the European uh, than the European Union. Then, I think it's important to focus on a specific products uh, or a specific services. Uh, you know, for example, e-books, electronic books. They have been relatively little mentioned throughout this uh, conference. The Accessibility Act will require e-books to be accessible from the beginning. You know, um, this would be really bringing a major shift in uh, in uh, in the world, because you know, um, persons um, who are blind, which are print disabled, as the Marrakesh Treaty said, would not need to wait until the book is published and then retrofit the book and make it accessible. They will have an accessible book from the beginning, at the same time than the rest of the people. So I think that this issue of access to information and it could be combined with you know the ebooks um, making accessible documents you know this morning we had a, a session with accessible pdfs and accessible the documents electronic documents in general it's it's also um, a very important and the other thing that um, the other type of instruments that i would like to to, to mention they have been referred here uh, briefly is the of course procurement uh, we have the directives on public procurement that contain a number of provisions that uh, can get can serve as inspiration for for a specific uh, obligations on buying accessible, but also funding. Whenever you have instruments for funding, it, it's something that has been addressed throughout the conference. Development cooperation funding, um, whether it is regional funding, whether it is a specific funding for. Um, uh, uh, buildings or renovation or infrastructures in which you ha will have ICT, accessibility needs to be spelled out. And because remember that at the beginning I said we, need, we will have a definition of accessibility, then you need to point out to those resources saying, and when I say that um, my um, new infrastructure will have to be accessible, and could be an electronic, um, an ICT infrastructure, including you know websites and some telecommunications facilities and so forth. I mean, making it compliant with the definition that we already have for a specific, uh, for example, section or, or solution. So um, these are just as ideas as you wanted to have uh, a little bit. And the final thing I would like to, to say is that it has been mentioned a lot throughout the conference, and I think it would be good to, to, to address, or at least to, to, to discuss uh, the issue, is the link between mainstream accessibility and assistive technology, ICT technology. What's happening with the ICT technology? How uh, we, we, we have got in the convention that, that um, um, universal design should not exclude uh, assistive technology. In the Accessibility Act, we go, I would say, uh, in that direction, but making very clear that mainstream technology, in order to be accessible, should provide interoperability with assistive technology. So how do we achieve that and, and, and uh, how we ensure that the two go, continue to go hand in hand? That is something that uh, you know, could be also addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ima. So I think uh, almost everything was said. Perhaps the only thing that I would like to highlight in particular for Europe, um, it will be perhaps some subject in mobile uh, accessibility. Uh, as we all know, the mobile accessibility will uh, actually uh, go beyond um, 70% it is it's estimated, so I think this is a very important topic as well as television 
that is also very important in this region. And uh, I think we have a request for, for a last speaker, if possible, just to keep on time with the timing that we have available. Please. Hi, my name is Monica Ackerman. I'm from uh, Scotiabank in Canada. And I know I'm not European, but uh, one of the things that I, I, I think there's value in taking a look at is service design. When we talk about digital accessibility, we tend to talk about the pieces so the app, the assistive technology, the document, but you know the entire customer journey or the public service journey in uh, the delivery of, uh, of digital services. Thank you very much for this intervention. So I think what we also have to keep in mind, perhaps, to bring some good practices also from other regions available, so to share with uh, European region so what is already in place and we can also replicate in the region and of course to take into consideration uh, the whole process because we can have uh, the, the, the most simple, we can have the structure of the web accessible but we, if we don't have the content so we didn't manage to have anything accessible and at the end if we don't have the person, the end user uh, with the necessary uh, digital knowledge on how to access this website. So definitely we have to work together and definitely this should be a global joint effort to, uh, to achieve what we all want, this inclusive digital society. Uh, I think we are almost at the end, of course, if uh, you want to... Conclude. Yes, and I'm not from the region either, but I had the pleasure of doing the fourth America Accessible uh, that we, you have organized. And I also, I think it would be interesting because there's tons of money invested in entrepreneurs and tons of applications that all those youngsters are creating to, to create solutions, to create services that most of them or many of them go viral and are really giving us some, the society, some needed services. So I think that a, a panel with entrepreneurs could be interesting because they've never heard about accessibility and they're eager to learn more about that. Thank you very much, Monica, for all this. And we will assure you all that everything that you express as a wish, as a concern, in this uh, ITU session will take into consideration and will try to reflect this in the development of this accessible Europe that will be held here, most probably in Austria, in December 11 and 12 December. So please save this date for us. With all this, I want to thank you all for listening, for spreading all this um, information around you and we are all waiting for you to join us in our Accessible Europe event. Thank you very much for your attention.